around the world. The Spirit is moving and a voice is being heard. Welcome to The Voice of Evangelism with David Langford. You can write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. We'll give you that address again at the close of today's broadcast. But here now is David Langford. Hello, friends. David Langford here today, and we'd like to welcome you to The Voice of Evangelism International Ministries. Today is Tuesday, and we greet you in the risen name of our Lord and Savior, Christ Jesus. I trust and I pray that you're spending time in prayer, communing, fellowshipping with the Lord. It's been said that prayer is when men exhale, breathe out themselves. But when they inhale, they inhale the Spirit of God. And that is, to me, the true personification of prayer. Exhaling yourself, ridding yourself from your clay jar, and inhaling the sweet fragrance and aroma of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe if we would do more of that, prayer, my, 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 what could God do in this hour? I am certitude. Our lack of prayer is truly harming us, and it's harming us in immeasurable ways. We, we don't realize what kind of damage we're doing to ourselves and the church, the body of Christ, because of our lack of prayer. Friend, prayer will change you. Prayer will help you. Prayer will edify you. Prayer will help you deal with your greed, your lust, your covetousness, your dishonesty, your lying, whatever that it might be. Some weeks ago, I had a, a long conversation with a couple, and uh, he had been very unfaithful to his wife. And I, and I was frank. I said, you've harmed, you have injured, you have hurt her terribly. And she can forgive you, but she can never forget that. She, she just can't. And it's sad, and, and, and people wonder why I preach so against sin, when you listen to the hurts, when you listen to the wound and the affliction that it has caused in people's lives, you, you understand we've got to do everything we can to deter sin from having a place of residence in our lives. And sadly, the modern church dare not say anything about sin. Adulterers, fornicators, drunkards, and liars should not feel comfortable in any church. I said they should not feel comfortable in any church. But when you don't have the Holy Ghost and you don't have the Word of God, that will flourish, that leaven will find a place of residence in that church, that body. And obviously, preachers don't care. They don't care. I quote it all the time. I, I mention it constantly, Revelation 5 and 8. And when he had taken the book, Jesus, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials of odors or golden vials of incense, incense, which are the prayers of the saints. Let me say it again. Are you providing incense for God's altar of incense? Are you, are you providing that? That's up to you. It's up to you and I to provide that incense, those odors for the altar of incense. Remember, the pattern 
of the Old Testament tabernacle came from heaven. God showed Moses the tabernacle, and so it was a form. Now, it was crude. It was crude, but it was a pattern. They built mostly all everything out of shidom wood and overlaid it with gold. Now, the lampstand, I believe the, the, the uh, altar of incense, those things were pure gold. But the Ark of the Covenant was shidom wood overlaid with gold. Uh, but I believe the lampstand, the seven candle light lampstand, I believe it was pure, pure gold in its entirety. So God put a spirit of craftsmanship on a faction of men. They were gifted, they were talented, and they carved out, just like the two angels on the Ark of the Covenant, and their wings come around, and they're, they're over the top of the Ark of the Covenant. And they, they carved that out in wood, and then they overlaid it with gold. It was, you might say it was gold-plated. It's just, just phenomenal. But Moses got that from the tabernacle in heaven. And so the prayers of the saints provide incense for the altar of incense. So please spend time in prayer. Again, let me encourage you to share the voice of evangelism with everyone that you can. If people like the truth and they like the word of God straight, uncompromised, share the ministry. Direct television every Tuesday night at 10 p.m., every Sunday morning at 10 a.m., channel 376, Christian Television Network. And then on Dish Network is channel 262, again, 10 p.m. Tuesday nights, 10 a.m. Sunday mornings. And then tell them to go to the website, the TV programs. And that's why we're praying about a place on Daystar. But the TV programs are posted a week later on YouTube. They're aired first on the network. Christian Television Network, CTN, and then we put them up the following week for people who don't have access to those programs so they can see what we're preaching on television. I left off yesterday talking about wine. I wanted to address the danger of leaven, the danger of fermentation, And as I talked about leaven in bread, I want to talk about leaven fermentation in wine. Now, you'll understand here in a few minutes why I wanted to discuss this. Alcohol comes, needless to say, in a variety of of different forms. The alcohol that relates to what some would call spirits or drinking is made from ethyl alcohol. Ethyl is the fermentation of sugar, yeast, and starch, many times containing fruit, grains, sugar, and and other ingredients. Ethyl alcohol is one of four different types of alcohol, but it is the only one that's safe to consume if one does so in small or moderate doses. Somebody once tried to define an alcoholic versus a problem drinker. There is no difference. Again, man's ideology seeks to try to delineate, to try to make a difference. But the alcohol is fermented, fermentation. Now, the reason I brought this up, I I was at a church once, and I was visiting. I wasn't preaching. I was just there. And they were serving communion. And... uh, when, it, when, when they served the, the wine, the, the, what I thought was grape juice, I turned it up, and I, if I could have, I would have spit it out. 
because it was genuine wine. It was not grapefruit juice. It was an alcoholic beverage. Now, I'm in absolute opposition to that. Again, leaven always represents sin, fermentation, fallacy, false doctrine. And if left unchecked, Paul said it will leaven or ferment the entire lump. At this particular church, when they served the grape juice, it was wine with alcohol in it. You could taste the bitterness. I have, I have never used wine for communion, and I never will. And you may say, well, what difference does it make? Oh, if you don't know the difference, I need to share that difference with you today. Wine is fermented. And I believe when Jesus took of wine at the Last Supper, I believe emphatically it was unfermented wine because it symbolized his precious blood. It symbolized his blood. The bread symbolized his body, and the wine symbolized his blood. Now, notice the phraseology here in Matthew 26, verses 28 and 29. Now, this is Jesus Christ speaking of himself. For this is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant, which is shed for many for remission of sin. This wine is symbolic of my holy, righteous, uncontaminated blood, which is going to be shed for the remission of sins, or the word remission means the forgiveness of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit, fruit of the vine, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. I don't know that you've ever heard this taught or even addressed, but I felt addressing leaven, we needed to look at it not only from the, the bread, but from the wine. Now, Jesus says something in this passage that's very, very distinct and very telling concerning his vicarious efficacious blood that would be shed, he says, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sin. You have sin in your life. What can cleanse you and make you free from that sin? The blood of Jesus Christ. Water can't do that. Doctrine uh, from men cannot do that. Works cannot do that. It takes the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. So he said, but I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine. That's why I believe it was right out of the grape, the literal physical grape. I believe the grapes were crushed before they had an opportunity to ferment. I believe that's what they used at the Last Supper. And here's the other clue. He said, this fruit of the vine, here's the second clue, until that day, when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. It will be new wine, even in the kingdom of God, not a fermented wine, because it represents the blood of the Lamb. And, and as I said, I, I was visiting that church, and when they shared the juice, it was true wine, because it had a bitter rancor taste to it, and if I could have, I would have spat it out. I, I, I think that is wrong. I'm not going to say they're going to hell for that, but I believe it should be grape juice, not fermented, not got, have any kind of fermentation to it. Why? Because it typifies the blood of the Lamb. Christ's blood 
is symbolized by the fruit of the vine. And when we drink it, we're saying, I accept your shed blood, which completed the finished work by the cross. Remember, Jesus was the sacrifice. The cross was the means. His body, his shed blood. Christ substituted what we call the Last Supper for Passover before he went to the cross. Men receive, they partake, they consume, they absorb, and they assimilate Christ into their lives. Man must realize Christ is everything, and without him, man is forever and eternally lost. The only way to be saved, listen to me, the only way to be saved is through the blood of the Lamb. There's not another thing you can do. I don't care what you've been told. I don't care what you believe. The only way to be saved is by the blood of the Lamb. Hebrews 9, 22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission for sin. Revelation 1, 5, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Only the blood of Jesus Christ can save a man, nothing else. I, I don't care what anybody tells you, you can only be saved through the blood of the Lamb. You say, well, I've been taught this, I've been taught that. So you've been taught wrong. I was taught wrong about things, but the word of God corrected my flawed understanding and my flawed doctrine. One of the great passages, one of the great stories is found in Luke chapter 7 about the woman who broke the alabaster box. This is another time. She stood behind Jesus at his feet. She was weeping. She began to wash his feet with her tears, and she did wipe the tears with the hairs of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Then Jesus, and this is not Simon Peter. Simon was like Judas. Simon was a popular name in that day. So this was another Simon. It wasn't Simon Peter. It was, it was another, uh, uh, actually it was a Pharisee. But anyway, he, he begins to convey a story, and, and he says to Simon about two men. One was forgiven just a little bit, and the other was forgiven a whole lot. Actually, it was 500 pence versus 50 pence, 10 times more debt. So the, both men were forgiven. The master forgave both men. And then he asked the question. Jesus asked the question. He said he forgave them. He said, tell me, therefore, which of them will love him the most? And, 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 and Simon says, well, uh, he, that, he that was forgiven the most is going to love the most. Jesus said, thou hast rightly judged. You, you took my parable, my analogy, whatever you want to call it there in Luke chapter 7, and you have correctly judged. Your discernment has been correct. But he also points out Simon's faults. He said, seest thou this woman? I've entered into your house, Simon. You gave me no water for my feet. She hath washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. In the, in the Middle East, it's, it's this normal policy, uh, a culture thing, to, to kiss on the cheek. But he said, you gave me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came into her house, or your house, she hath not ceased. She's not stopped kissing my feet, my head with oil. She anointed. You? <laughs> You haven't anointed me with nothing. Wherefore I say unto thee, Simon, her sins, which are many, because that was the problem, 
she was a, a prostitute. That's what most theologians believe. She was a lady of the night. She was a sinner. But he said, I, she's done all of these things. You've done none of these things. He said, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loveth me much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. You wonder why I love the Lord so much? You, you wonder why I have such an affinity for Christ and his word? I've been forgiven so much. Such a wretched sinner, I understand what God has done for me. I, I tell him. If it had been left up to me and I were in your shoes, God, I would have sent me to hell. That's my human reasoning. But God's great agape love, he loved me beyond my sins and saw my need. Then Jesus does something. He turns to the woman and he addresses her. He's, he's no longer talking to Simon, the Pharisee. He turns now and he speaks to the woman. And here's what he said to her. Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. Go in peace. Now, what did Jesus tell her saved her? He said, your faith. Now, she was living on the side before Calvary. You see, I know men want to hype up Pentecost, and, and it was great. Don't get me wrong. I'm not diminishing Pentecost. But they want to act like something all of a sudden changed. The way of salvation never changed. You've heard me teach and preach. The covenant changed. It, tilt, it still took the shedding of blood. I said it still took the shedding of blood. But this time it was from a spotless, sinless lamb. That's why it was done one time and once and for all. And it's, no, it's never needed again. So the same way that Abraham was saved, having faith and what Jesus would do when he came. You and I live on the other side of the cross. We have faith in what he did. You weren't there. I wasn't there. We didn't see it. But we read about it. And through the Holy Spirit of God, it becomes a revelation. It becomes real to us. It becomes as real to us as it was the day it took place. And we're convicted. And we realize the price that he paid. But Christ said to the woman emphatically, thy faith hath saved thee. Faith in what? Faith in his vicarious, efficacious work he would accomplish on the cross. It, 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 it disturbs me profusely, and I, I reckon you know that by now. I mean, it, it does. It disturbs me beyond measure. You, you can't measure how disturbed I am when I realize men put their confidence, men put their faith in something else. That's why I say your faith is misplaced. Your faith must solely be in what Jesus did on the cross. The cross. Even though John the Baptist preached repentance, he was preparing the way of the Lord. This man, this man, John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He, he was pointing to this man, Jesus Christ. He's going to take away sin. Everything was a spiritual covering, just like the doorpost, the door lentil. He told Moses, Mark the doorpost and the door lentil with the blood of the lamb. Left and right doorpost, the piece of wood over the doorpost, the door lentil. Mark it with blood. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Anything that's covered in the blood will never suffer the wrath of God. Anything that's washed, cleansed, covered by the blood of the Lamb will never suffer the wrath of God. If the blood is not applied, you will suffer the wrath. Did not the Egyptians who did not have their doorpost and door lentil covered in blood, did they not suffer the wrath of God? 
Sure they did. Firstborn male. When this began, I believe it's Exodus chapter 3, God tells Moses, he said, Pharaoh has touched my firstborn, Israel. I'm going to touch his firstborn. I said chapter 3, it's chapter 4, verse 22. Thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, thus saith the Lord, Israel is my son, even my firstborn. So God was saying, I'm going to touch your firstborn because you have touched my firstborn. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Jacob's name is changed to Israel. Maybe I'll teach on that sometime, the significance of the change. But all of this is based on the shedding of blood. Now, getting back to my point about the wine. Every one of you that's ever drank in any alcoholic beverage of any sort, it, it has a, a, a bitter rancor taste. It, it's because it's fermented. Huh. And the greater the fermentation, the greater the bite, if I can use that word, and just like people who smoke cigarettes, they look for the brand, the type of cigarette that lines up with their palate, their taste. I noticed this through the years. People who, after they eat, they, they want a cigarette or a chew of tobacco right after they get through. Some of them are still cleansing their mouth from their food. I watched a guy one time at Buffalo Wings. He was sitting across from me, three or four tables, and he was he was, man, he was devouring his chicken wings. But he had no sooner than finished, still, as we say, sucking his teeth, getting the small pieces and fragments of chicken out of his mouth. He reached down in his pocket, pulled out his tobacco, and put a big old wad in, in, in his bottom lip. And I thought, man, the guy hasn't even hardly finished eating. But see, he wanted that nicotine. He wanted that flavor. He wanted that taste because that matches his palate. And, and, and then we get into neurology, how they become addicted neurologically to those tastes. But we all know if we're honest, alcohol has a bite. It's bitter to it. And then people want to argue about wine in the Bible. Well, in Isaiah 65 and verse 8, thus saith the Lord, as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, destroy it not, for a blessing is in it. Now, I'm not going to get into a bunch of theological jargon and rhetoric, but the blessing, I believe Isaiah was having a, 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 a type of a future insight of the shedding of the blood of Christ, because we know Isaiah 53 is filled with the barbarity of Christ's crucifixion. You know, Isaiah 53, 5, he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. Isaiah 53, 2, he hath no form, no comeliness, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we would desire him. Isaiah 53, 12, because he hath poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors. He bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. I believe he was having a, 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 a revelational understanding of the, the, of the, the cluster, the, the, the wine found in the cluster, in the grape itself. And one saith, destroy it not. Why? Typifies Jesus. For a blessing is in it. Redemption is in it. But again, the, the, the wine, the juice in the cluster has not had a chance to be fermented. Now, I, I think I can talk about some of these things with great understanding because I used to drink like a fish. So we see the, the, the marriage at Cana in John chapter 2, don't we? Well, guess what's happened? They run out of wine. 
And they come to Jesus, actually his mother. They run out of wine. This is, this is, a, this is a, a, a marriage gathering, a marriage ceremony. And they run out of wine. M- M- Mary, she says to Jesus, they have no wine. Jesus said to Mary, woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. But Mary says unto the servants, whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were six water pots of stone after the manner of purifying of the Jews containing two or three firkins apiece. Now, without getting into a lot of detail, I believe these were water, the water there was sanctified because it was the manner of purifying of the Jews. Jesus says unto them, fill the water pots with water, fill them up to the brim. Now, obviously, these water pots that the Bible says were used for purifying of Jews, they were now empty. So Jesus says, fill them back up. And and it was um, H.A. Ironsides. He had a little he had a little statement. And I remembered it. He said, "Fill the water pots, fill them to the brim. Trust in the Lord, and leave the miracles up to Him." And this is what the Scripture says there. Jesus says, "Fill the water pots with water." And they filled them to the brim. I, I love that little poem, if you want to call it a poem. Fill the water pots, fill them to the brim, and leave all the miracles up to him. Now, let me show you why I believe the miracle was so great, and the grape juice was that. It was not fermented wine, but it was grape juice. Because the Bible said when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, where it came from, but the servants which drew the water, they knew. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. There's a whole lot of, there's a whole lot of information here, spiritual information. And saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine. And when men have well drunk, they're they're really feeling good, they're tipsy. Then that which is worse, that's what they bring out. But he said, Thou hast kept the good wine even until now, or to the very end of the um, wedding. The, the 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 wedding party after the vows and everything is done. And so if you read that, you understand what the governor is saying. He's saying after men get pretty drunk, they'll drink anything. So they bring out the rot gut. They bring out the putrid. They bring out the worst wine. He said, but that's not what you did. You kept the best Till the last. You kept the good wine. Oh, the the Welch's grape juice, that which was just crushed right out of the cluster, right out of the, the grape itself. That's another reason I believe at the Last Supper, the wine was not fermented. You know, I... I, I Having been in ministry for over 43 years, you, you hear a lot of questions, you hear a lot of silly, cynical stuff, and you have to learn. You have to learn how to address a, a, a plethora of topics. You have, you have to grow <laughs> because, you know, people will throw stuff out there at you, and they don't know why they're believing it themselves. This was because what they were taught. But, but you see, this is why I, I try to bring, and I'll say it again, you've heard me say this, a balanced dietary program of the Word of God. I, I try to address the things the church needs to know. Now, 
the parable, let me, let me, let me, before, before we get back on that, the bread and the grape juice that we are receiving is symbolic of who? Jesus. So then I believe neither the bread nor the wine can be fermented. If it is, it is a false representation. Now I know those of you that are Catholic who listen to me, you may get upset. You may get upset. But I gave you Bible why I do not believe it was fermented wine because it typified the body of Christ. Fermentation is, 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 is a type of decay. It's fermenting. The effervescence, that's why Jesus said you can't put new wine in old wine skins because in the effervescence, while it is fermenting, it'll rent and tear the old wine sack. He said you lose then both the sack and the wine. So you don't put new wine in old vessels. You see, when you study all of this out and you, you look at it, and the, now I didn't make the analogy. Jesus said at the Last Supper, he broke the bread, here, take, eat, this is my body. He took the cup, he blessed it, said, drink you all of it, for it is my blood which is shed for you for the, uh, the New Testament covenant. The New Testament covenant. This is my blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until, I, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. When I drink it new, new wine with you where? In my Father's kingdom. Um, Paul, Ephesians 5 and 18 be not drunk with wine where it is in excess, but be ye filled with what? Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. We're told, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. Now, some people will take that and say, well, you can drink some. Well, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be so dogmatic to say if you drank a glass of red wine, a glass of white wine, a Chardonnay, or whatever the case, you're going to go to hell for drinking a glass of wine. I, I, I wouldn't say that, but I know David Langford. So if I drink the glass, I'm going to begin to feel my body and my mind changing and my flesh likes the change. And I say, well, I'm going to drink just one more. And I drink another one. And I like even more the feeling, the sensation. Then I say, I'll, I'll drink another one. Well, you know what? You end up getting drunk. See? So now drunkards don't inherit the kingdom of God. So the best thing you can do is leave it alone in its totality. See? Uh, I've been out with professional people. I remember having dinner uh, with uh, Lieutenant Colonel Oliver North. And, and, and I remember at the dinner, they poured him a glass of red wine. And, I, and he, he's a professing Christian, and I, I observed him. He probably drank a quarter, maybe no more than a third of the glass of wine, and that was it. We had dinner. We had fellowship for probably two or three hours. He never touched the wine again. Now, how how could I condemn him to hell when he didn't make he didn't drink enough wine to make a mouse drunk? See, volume, percentage alcohol, volume of a man's size. See, but my point is, I don't believe Jesus drank fermented wine, and say to the disciples, this fermented wine represents my blood. We know he had to be conceived of the Holy Ghost so he would, his blood would be sinless blood, spotless blood. See, that, 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 that's, that's the whole purpose of the, uh, the, the, the birth through the Holy Ghost of the life of Christ. 
That, that, that was the whole reason. Because had Jesus been conceived through Joseph, the contamination, the putrefaction would be passed on to Jesus. And then his blood, his sacrifice, would have not been acceptable for our sins because it was just another sin, sinful sacrifice of tainted blood. So I don't believe that we should take leavened bread, and I don't believe we should drink wine. Now, let's look back for just a moment at the woman here in Matthew chapter 13, verse 33. The kingdom of heaven is like unto leaven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. So remember, now the whole lump of dough is fermented. It has leaven in it. The woman here speaks of someone who is evil in a moral and religious manner. The woman hid or she concealed what she was doing when she placed the leaven into the meal or the flour. Why would you hide it? As I said, you can put leaven, yeast, into dough. Now, over a 30, 40 minute hour period, you, you can see the dough is rising, but to sit there and see it actually do it with your natural eye, you, you can't see it, but it's, it's doing its work. It's, it's doing its work. It's, it's, it's leavening the whole lump because it's mixed in there. Jesus' ministry was public. He, he didn't do anything connivingly or dishonestly. He, he didn't work like that. He didn't, he didn't live his life like that. But the woman, what she was doing, she didn't want anybody to know what she had done. So therefore she hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. The leaven was deliberately taken. It was not by mistake. It was not by accident. Let, let me say this. When men teach something and the scriptures clearly teach and demonstrate something else, this is how men become deceived. Nope. I'm not going to believe that. I'm going to believe this no matter what. Secondly, the woman deliberately mixed the leaven within the pure or the unleavened meal. This is why I believe leaven is a type of sin. There was no leaven in the life of Christ. No, no sin. <clears throat> Even uh, Peter said there was no guile found in his mouth. And thirdly, her act of concealment silently transformed the entire lump. It wasn't a third of the lump, half of the lump, but it transformed the entire lump. That's why Paul said to the church at Corinth, you must deal with this leaven that is in your church lest you leaven the whole lump. I want you to get that before we move on. Some argue the leaven in this passage represents the gospel. But again, through the scriptures, leaven is always portrayed as something evil in both religion and politics. 2 Corinthians 4, 3, Paul said, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are what? That are lost. Remember the woman hid three measures of leaven in the mill. She hid it. Paul said, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. That's why I don't believe it can represent the gospel. It represents sin, leaven, debasedness, debauchery, fermentation, etc. Throughout the scriptures, 
throughout the scriptures, and, and, and I admittedly, my understanding is limited, my knowledge is limited, but throughout the scriptures, nowhere has leaven ever been used in a positive way, in a good way. Every time Jesus spoke about it or Paul spoke about it, it was in a negative application, negative. That's why I do not believe the leaven represents the gospel. But it demonstrates what the devil would try to do here and then. Remember, this all starts out <coughs> about the sower of the seed. And what does the enemy do? He comes and he sows tares among the wheat. The church is supposed to be holy, pure, without spot, without wrinkle, without blemish. You know, if you look up the word wrinkle there, in the Greek, Ephesians 5 and 27, that it might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy without a blemish. When you look up the word wrinkle, it means there's no guidance, there's no direction. You ever seen a, a, a wrinkled blouse, a wrinkled shirt? Well, you see the crease goes two inches and breaks off and goes three other ways. And then you follow one of those and it goes five other ways. Wrinkles make any garment look terrible. Look like you slept in it. Well, you don't want to wear that to a business meeting. You don't want to wear that to church. Women don't want to wear an all wrinkled up blouse. Well, God's church is not going to look like that. God's church is not going to be fermented. And because she hid it, she was concealing her evil deeds. Remember Jesus said about the tares. He said, while men slept, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. The disciples, who did this? Who did this? He said, an enemy hath done this. I believe the woman represents an enemy to the church, the body of Christ, because she took the leaven and she hid it to leaven the whole lump and do her damage and then walk away. Is that not what the enemy did to the field where Christ sowed the seed, the good seed? Then the enemy comes along behind him and sows the tares, dastardly evil deeds, and went his way. Then Jesus says, you got to wait till the end. You, you, you cannot try to do this, separate the wheat and the tares. You'll destroy the good. And I taught you weeks and weeks ago how the roots of the tares co-mingle with the roots of the wheat. So when you try to pull up the tare, you pull up the wheat. Anything that's ever been washed and redeemed by the blood of the Lamb will never suffer the wrath of God. The tares will suffer the wrath of God. The wheat never will. Therefore, I wholly embrace the doctrine that leaven is evil because when taking communion, we are admonished to use unleavened bread because the bread typifies the body and the purity of Christ. And I don't believe the wine was fermented. Now, I'm not saying that's a sin. I know... Uh, Catholics, Lutherans, Episcopalians, I, I, I don't know how many use genuine wine, ferment, ferment, fermented wine, but I know a lot do, but I, I don't believe in that. Now, most of them, but I've, as I said, I've seen it. They use regular, regular bread, and you're not supposed to do that. In the Catholic Church, the wafer is I'm pretty certain I can be corrected if you're a Catholic and you listen, you can you can write me a letter and say, hey, the wafer is unleavened. But you know I'm telling the truth when I say the wine is fermented. So now you're 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 really convoluting and you're twisting everything to mix fermented wine with unleavened bread. If the bread has to be unleavened, then the wine should be unleavened because it's fermentation. There are so many things that are so egregious in the modern church. Now, let, 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 me, let me close with this today. Christ is the only one qualified to sever the leaven 
hidden within the church, the body of Christ, when he appears at his second coming. I believe there are godly people associated with denominations, organizations, and religions that are not right, but but they seek to live right. They, they seek to live right. Though David did wrong, Nathan was not wrong because of what David did. So Israel as a nation, the entire nation was not corrupt, but, but sadly the devil found a place in David's life where he could do something and accomplish something in opposition to God in David's life. And, and that's why Jesus said, the devil, the prince of the world, he has nothing in me. There's no leaven. There's no fermentation. There's nothing to appeal to. There's nothing to touch with his wicked finger in my life because my life is a holy life. At Christ's second advent, at Christ's second coming, he will do all the separating, wheat and tares, leaven. He'll separate that. The parable of the large net all was gathered in, and he called the bad vessels out of the good vessels. We'll get into that. That's we're not there yet. We'll we'll talk about the large net. See, all all of this is synonymous, synoptic. It's it's all the same. Now I know men have sought to twist it. I've had men to tell me, "No, the leaven there is the church." That's no. Why do you hide it? Why do you hide it? Because it's not right. Why does Congress hide such legislation? Why do they hide it? Why do they conceal it? They don't want you to know what they're doing because they're corrupt. They're evil. They don't want you to know. That's not how God operates. What did, what did he do the first thing when he's recreating the heaven and the earth in Genesis 1? And God said, let there be what? Let there be light. He illuminated so he could see everything that was taking place. Now, he could do that without the light because he is light. <laughs> but that's talking about the natural light to shine on a chaotic uh, earth that's without form and void and darkness was upon it. So he, he's, he's separating the light from the darkness. But he himself is light. He didn't need that light. The earth. In the process of photosynthesis and growth, et cetera, et cetera, the earth needed the light. The earth needed the light. Satan seeks to corrupt the church, the body of Christ, by filling it with leaven or with fallacy. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for your love and support. Share the ministry with everyone you can. I'll see you next week the in the Voice Lord. of Evangelism with David Langford is brought to you by the faithful listeners and supporters throughout America. If you're looking for an uncompromising message, we invite you to tune in each week to The Voice of Evangelism. For more information, write to The Voice of Evangelism at P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020. That's P.O. Box 502, Kayser, North Carolina, 28020.